Section 25 of Diary, Volume 1, by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. 29th December, 1649. I christened Sir Hugh Riley's child with Sir George Radcliffe in our chapel. The parents being so poor that they had provided no gossips, so as several of us drawing lots, it fell on me, the Dean of Peterborough, Dr. Cousin, officiating. We named it Andrew, being on the eve of that Apostle's Day. 1st January 1649-50 to I began this jubilee with the public office in our chapel, dined at my Lady Herbert's, wife of Sir Edward Herbert, afterward Lord Keeper. 18th January 1650 This night was the Prince of Condé and his brother carried prisoners to the Bois de Vincennes. 6 February 1650 In the evening came Signor Alessandro, one of the Cardinal Mazarin's musicians, and a person of great name for his knowledge in that art, to visit my wife, and sung before diverse persons of quality in my chamber. 1st March 1650 I went to see the Masquerados, which was very fantastic, but nothing so quiet and solemn as I found it at Venice. 13th March 1650 Saw a triumph in Monsieur Del Camp's Academy, where diverse of the French and English noblesse, especially my Lord of Ossory and Richard, sons to the Marquis of Ormond, afterward Duke, did their exercises on horseback in noble equipage, before a world of spectators and great persons, men and ladies. It ended in a collation. 25th April 1650 I went out of town to see Madrid, a palace so called, built by Francis I. It is observable only for its open manner of architecture, being much of terraces and galleries, one over another, to the very roof, and for the materials, which are mostly of earth, painted like porcelain or chinaware, whose colours appear very fresh, but is very fragile. There are whole statues and relievos of this pottery, chimney pieces and columns, both within and without. Under the chapel is a chimney, in the midst of a room parted from the Salle des Gardes. The house is fortified with a deep ditch, and has an admirable vista toward the Bois de Boulogne and river. 30th of April, 1650. I went to see the collection of the famous sculptor Stefano de la Bella, returning now into Italy, and bought some prints, and likewise visited Perel, the landscape graver. 3rd May 1650 At the hospital of La Charité I saw the operation of cutting for the stone. A child of eight or nine years old underwent the operation with most extraordinary patience and expressing great joy when he saw the stone was drawn. The use I made of it was to give Almighty God hearty thanks that I had not been subject to this deplorable infirmity. 7th May 1650 I went with Sir Richard Brown's lady and my wife, together with the Earl of Chesterfield, Lord Ossory and his brother, to Von Baer, a place near the city, famous for butter. When coming homeward, being on foot, a quarrel arose between Lord Ossory and a man in a garden, who thrust Lord Ossory from the gate with uncivil language on which our young gallant struck the fellow on the pate and bade him ask pardon, which he did with much submission, and so we parted. But we were not gone far before we heard a noise behind us and saw people coming with guns, swords, staves and forks, and who followed flinging stones, on which we turned and were forced to engage, and with our swords, stones and the help of our servants, one of whom had a pistol, made our retreat for near a quarter of a mile when we took shelter in a house where we were besieged and at length forced to submit to be prisoners. Lord Hatton, with some others, were taken prisoners in the flight and his lordship was confined under three locks and as many doors in this rude fellow's master's house, who pretended to be steward to Monsieur Saint-Germain. 
one of the presidents of the Grand Chambre du Parlement, and a canon of Notre Dame. Several of us were much hurt. One of our lackeys escaping to Paris caused the bailiff of Saint-Germain to come with his guard and rescue us. Immediately afterward came Monsieur Saint-Germain himself, in great wrath, on hearing that his housekeeper was assaulted. But when he saw the king's officers, the gentlemen and noblemen, with his majesty's resident, and understood the occasion, he was ashamed of the accident, requesting the fellow's pardon, and desiring the ladies to accept their submission, and a supper at his house. It was ten o'clock at night ere we got to Paris, guarded by Prince Griffith, a Welsh hero going under that name, and well known in England for his extravagances, together with the scholars of two academies, who came forth to assist and meet us on horseback, and would fain have alarmed the town we received the affront from, which, with much ado, we prevented. 12th May, 1650. Complaint being come to the Queen and Court of France of the affront we had received, the President was ordered to ask pardon of Sir R. Brown, his Majesty's resident, and the fellow, to make submission and be dismissed. There came along with him the President de Tou, son of the great Tuanus, the historian, and so all was composed. But I have often heard that gallant gentleman, my Lord Ossery, affirm solemnly that in all the conflicts he was ever in at sea or on land, in the most desperate of both which he had often been, he believed he was never in so much danger as when these people rose against us. He used to call it the Bataille de Vambre, and remember it with a great deal of mirth as an adventure on Cavalier. 24th May 1650 We were invited by the noble academies to a running at the ring where were many brave horses, gallants and ladies, my Lord Stanton Hope entertaining us with a collation. 12th June 1650. Being Trinity Sunday, the Dean of Peterborough preached, after which there was an ordination of two divines, Durrell and Brevent, the one was afterward Dean of Windsor, the other of Durham, both very learned persons. The Bishop of Galloway officiated with great gravity, after a pious and learned exhortation, declaring the weight and dignity of their functions especially now in a time of the poor Church of England's affliction. He magnified the sublimity of the calling from the object, viz. the salvation of men's souls, and the glory of God, producing many human instances of the transitoriness and vanity of all other dignity. That of all the triumphs the Roman conquerors made, none was comparable to that of our blessed Saviour's when he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men, namely that of the Holy Spirit by which his faithful and painful ministers triumphed over Satan as often as they reduced a sinner from the error of his ways. He then proceeded to the ordination. They were presented by the dean in their surplices before the altar, the bishop sitting in a chair at one side, and so were made both deacons and priests at the same time, in regard to the necessity of the times, there being so few bishops left in England, and consequently danger of a failure of both functions. Lastly, they proceeded to the communion. This was all performed in Sir Richard Brown's chapel at Paris. 13th June 1650 I say to the famous sculptor Nanteuil, who was afterward made a knight by the French king for his art. He engraved my picture in copper. At a future time he presented me with my own picture, done all with his pen, an extraordinary curiosity. 21st June 1650 I went to see the Samaritan or pump at the end of the Pont Neuf, which though to appearance promising no great matter, is, besides the machine, furnished with innumerable rarities, both of art and nature, especially the costly grotto, where are the fairest corals growing out of the very rock that I have ever seen, also great pieces of crystals, amethysts, gold in the mine, and other metals and marcasites, with two great conkers, which the owner told us cost him two hundred crowns at Amsterdam. 
He showed us many landscapes and prospects, very rarely painted in miniature, some with the pen and crayon, diverse antiquities and relievos of Rome, above all that of the inside of the amphitheatre of Titus, incomparably drawn by M. Seclair himself. Two boys and three skeletons, moulded by Fiammingo, a book of statues with a pen made for Henry the Fourth, rarely executed, and by which one may discover many errors in the tied deuce of Perrier, who has added diverse conceits of his own that are not in the originals. He has likewise an infinite collection of tied deuce, richly bound in Morocco. He led us into a stately chamber, furnished to have entertained a prince with pictures of the greatest masters, especially of Venus of Perino de Vaga, the putty carved in the chimney-piece by the Fleming, the vases of porcelain and many designed by Raphael, some paintings of Poussin and Fioravanti, antiques in brass, the looking-glass and stands rarely carved. In a word, all was great, choice and magnificent, and not to be passed by, as I has often done, without the least suspicion that there were such rare things to be seen in that place. At a future visit he showed a new grotto and a bathing place, hewn through the battlements of the arches of Neuf into a wide vault at the intercolumniation, so that the coaches and horses thundered over our heads. Calais 27th June 1650, I made my will, and taking leave of my wife and other friends, took horse for England, paying the messenger eight pistols for me and my servant to Calais, setting out with seventeen in company well armed, some Portuguese, Swiss and French, whereof six were captains and officers. We came the first night to Beaumont, next day to Beauvais, and lay at Poix, and the next, without dining, reached Abbeville. Next dined at Montreuil, and proceeding met a company on foot, being now within the inroads of the parties which dangerously infest this day's journey from Saint-Omer and the frontiers, which we drew very near to, ready and resolute to charge through, and accordingly were ordered and led by a captain of our train. But as we were on the speed, they called out and proved to be Scotchmen, newly raised and landed, and few among them armed. This night we were well treated at Boulogne. The next day we marched in good order, the passage being now exceeding dangerous, and got to Calais by a little after two. The sun so scorched my face that it made the skin peel off. I dined with Mr. Booth, His Majesty's agent, and about three in the afternoon embarked in the packet boat. Hearing there was a pirate then also setting sail, we had security from molestation, and so with a fair southwest wind, in seven hours we landed at Dover. The busy watchman would have us to the mare to be searched, but the gentleman being in bed, we were dismissed. Next day, being Sunday, they would not permit us to ride post, so that afternoon our trunks were visited. The next morning, by four, we set out for Canterbury, where I met with my lady Catherine Scott, whom that very day, twelve months before, I met at sea going for France. She had been visiting Sir Thomas Payton, not far off, and would needs carry me in her coach to Gravesend. We dined at Sittingbourne, came late to Gravesend, and so to Deptford, taking leave of my lady about four the next morning. 5th July 1650 I supped in the city with my lady Catherine Scott, at one Mr. Dubois, where was a gentlewoman called Everard, who was a very great chemist. Sunday 7th July 1650 in the afternoon, having a mind to see what was doing among the rebels, then in full possession at White Hall, I went thither, and found one at exercise in the chapel, after their way. Thence to St. James, where another was preaching in the court abroad. 17th July 1650. I went to London to obtain a pass, intending but a short stay in England. 25th July 1650. 
I went by Epsom to Watton, saluting Sir Robert Cook and my sister Glanville. The country was now much molested by soldiers, who took away gentlemen's horses for the service of the state, as then called. 4th August 1650. I heard a sermon at the Rolls, and in the afternoon wandered to divers churches, the pulpits full of novices and novelties. 6th August 1650, to Mr. Walker's, a good painter, who showed me an excellent copy of Titian. 12th August 1650, set out for Paris, taking post at Gravesend, and so that night to Canterbury, where being surprised by the soldiers, and having only an antiquated pass, with some fortunate dexterity I got clear of them, though not without extraordinary hazard having before counterfeited one with success, it being so difficult to procure one of the rebels without entering into oaths, which I never would do. At Dover, money to the searchers and officers was as authentic as the hand and seal of Bradshaw himself, where I had not so much as my trunk opened. Calais, 13th August 1650 at six in the evening set sail for Calais, the wind not favourable. I was very seasick, coming to an anchor about one o'clock. About five in the morning we had a long boat to carry us to land, though at a good distance. This we willingly entered, because two vessels were chasing us, but being now almost at the harbour's mouth, through inadvertency there broke in upon us two such heavy seas as had almost sunk the boat, I being near the middle up in water. Our steersman, it seems, apprehensive of the danger, was preparing to leap into the sea and trust to swimming, but seeing the vessel emerge, he put her into the pier, and so, God be thanked, we got to Calais, though wet. Here I waited for company, the passage toward Paris being still infested with volunteers from the Spanish frontiers. 16th August 1650. The regiment of Picardy, consisting of about 1,400 horse and foot, among them was a captain whom I knew, being come to town, I took horses for myself and servant, and marched under their protection to Boulogne. It was a miserable spectacle to see how these tattered soldiers pillaged the poor people of their sheep, poultry, corn, cattle, and whatever came in their way but they had such ill pay that they were ready themselves to starve. As we passed Saint-Denis, the people were in uproar, the guards doubled, and everybody running with their movables to Paris on an alarm that the enemy was within five leagues of them. So miserably exposed was even this part of France at this time. Paris the 30th I got to Paris after an absence of two months only. 1st September 1650. My Lady Herbert invited me to dinner, Paris and indeed all France being full of loyal fugitives. Came Mr Waller to see me, about a child of his which the Popish midwife had baptised. 15th October 1650. Sir Thomas Osborne, afterward Lord Treasurer, and Lord Stanhope, shot for a wager of five louis to be spent on a treat. They shot so exact that it was a drawn match. 1st November 1650. Took leave of my Lord Stanhope, going on his journey toward Italy. Also visited my Lord Hatton, controller of His Majesty's household, the Countess of Morton, governess to the Lady Henrietta, and Mrs. Gardiner, one of the Queen's maids of honour. 6th November 1650. Sir Thomas Osborne, supping with us, his groom was set upon in the street before our house, and received two wounds, but gave the assassin nine, who was carried off to the Charité Hospital. St. Thomas went for England on the 8th, and carried diverse letters for me to my friends. 16th November 1650. I went to Monsieur Vices, the French King's Secretary, to a concert of French music and voices, consisting of twenty-four, two theorbos, and but one bass viol, 
being a rehearsal of what was to be sung at Vespers at San Cecilia's on her feast, she being patroness of musicians. News arrived of the death of the Princess of Orange of the smallpox. 14th December 1650 I went to visit Mr. Ratcliffe, in whose lodging was an impostor that had liked to have imposed upon us a pretended secret of multiplying gold. It is certain he has lived some time in Paris in extraordinary splendour, but I found him to be an egregious cheat. 22nd December 1650 came the learned Dr. Bowie to visit me. 31st of December 1650 I gave God thanks for his mercy and protection the past year and made up my accounts, which came this year to 7,015 livres, near £600 sterling. 1st of January 1650-51 to I wrote to my brother at Watton about his garden and fountains. After evening prayer, Mr. Wainsford called on me. He had long been consul at Aleppo, and told me many strange things of those countries, the Arabs especially. 27th January 1651 I had letters of the death of Mrs. Newton, my grandmother-in-law. She had a most tender care of me during my childhood, and was a woman of extraordinary charity and piety. 29th January 1651 Dr. Duncan preached on 8 Matthews verse 34, showing the mischief of covetousness. My Lord Marquis of Ormond and Inchiquin, come newly out of Ireland, were this day at chapel. 9th February 1651, Cardinal Mazarin was proscribed by Arrêt du Parlement and great commotions began in Paris. 23rd February 1651, I went to see the Bonhomme, a convent that has a fair cloister painted with the lives of hermits, a glorious altar now erecting in the chapel, the garden on the rock with diverse de descents, with a fine vineyard and a delicate prospect toward the city. 24th February 1651, I went to see a dromedary, a very monstrous beast, much like the camel but larger. There was also dancing on the rope, but above all, surprising to those who were ignorant of the address, was the water spouter, who, drinking only fountain water, rendered out of his mouth in several glasses all sorts of wine and sweet waters. For a piece of money he discovered the secret to me. I waited on Friar Nicholas at the convent at Chaillot, who, being an excellent chemist, showed me his laboratory and rare collection of spagyrical remedies. He was both physician and apothecary of the convent, and instead of the names of his drugs, he painted his boxes and pots with the figure of the drug, or simple, contained in them. He showed me as a rarity some element of antimony. He had cured Monsieur Senatin of a desperate sickness for which there was building a monumental altar that was to cost £1,500. 11th March 1651 I went to the Châtelet or prison where a malefactor was to have the question or torture given to him, he refusing to confess the robbery with which he was charged, which was thus. They first bound his wrist with a strong rope or small cable and one end of it to an iron ring made fast to the wall, about four feet from the floor and then his feet with another cable, fastened about five feet farther than his utmost length, to another ring on the floor of the room. Thus suspended, and yet lying but aslant, they slid a horse of wood under the rope which bound his feet, which so exceedingly stiffened it as severed the fellow's joints in miserable sort, drawing him out at length in an extraordinary manner, he having only a pair of linen drawers on his naked body. Then they questioned him of a robbery, the lieutenant being present and a clerk that wrote, which not confessing, they put a higher horse under the rope to increase the torture and extension. In this agony, confessing nothing, the executioner with a horn, just such as they drench horses with, stuck the end of it into his mouth and poured the quantity of two buckets of water down his throat and over him, 
which so prodigiously swelled him as would have pitied and affrighted any one to see it. For all this he denied all that was charged to him. They then let him down and carried him before a warm fire to bring him to himself, being now to all appearance dead with pain. What became of him I know not, but the gentleman whom he robbed constantly averred him to be the man, and the fellow's suspicious pale looks, before he knew he should be racked, betrayed some guilt. The lieutenant was also of that opinion, and told us at first sight, for he was a lean, dry, black young man, he would conquer the torture, and so it seems they could not hang him, but did use in such cases where the evidence is very presumptive to send them to the galleys which is as bad as death there was another malefactor to succeed but the spectacle was so uncomfortable that i was not able to stay the sight of another it represented yet to me the intolerable sufferings which our blessed saviour must needs undergo when his body was hanging with all its weight upon the nails on the cross 20th March 1651 I went this night with my wife to a ball at the Marquis de Crèvecoeur, where were diverse princes, dukes and great persons, but what appeared to me very mean was that it began with a puppet play. 6th May 1651 I attended the ambassador to a masque at court, where the French king in person danced five entries, but being engaged in discourse and better entertained with one of the Queen Regent's secretaries, I soon left the entertainment. 11th May 1651 To the Palace Cardinal, where the Master of the Ceremonies placed me to see the Royal Mask or Opera. The first scene represented a chariot of singers composed of the rarest voices that could be procured, representing Cornaro and Temperance, this was overthrown by Bacchus and his revellers. The rest consisted of several entries and pageants of excess by all the elements. A mask representing fire was admirable. Then came a Venus out of the clouds. The conclusion was a heaven, whither all ascended. But the glory of the mask was the great persons performing in it. The French king, his brother the Duke of Anjou, with all the grandees of the court the king performing to the admiration of all. The music was twenty-nine violins vested à l'antique, but the habits of the maskers were stupendously rich and glorious. 23rd May 1651 I went to take leave of the ambassadors for Spain, which were my Lord Treasurer Cottingdon and Sir Edward Hyde, and as I returned I visited Mr Morin's garden, and his other rarities, especially corals, minerals, stones, and natural curiosities. Crabs of the Red Sea, the body no bigger than a small bird's egg, but flatter, and the two legs or claws a foot in length. He had abundance of shells, at least one thousand sorts, which furnished a cabinet of great price, and had a very curious collection of scarabees and insects, of which he was compiling a natural history. He had also the pictures of his choice flowers and plants in miniature. He told me there were ten thousand sorts of tulips only. He had tied deuce out of number, the head of the rhinoceros bird, which was very extravagant, and one butterfly resembling a perfect bird. 25th May 1651 I went to visit Mr Thomas White, a learned priest and famous philosopher, author of the book De Mundo, with whose worthy brother I was well acquainted at Rome. I was shown a cabinet of Marocan or Turkey leather, so curiously inlaid with other leather and gilding that the workmen demanded for it 800 livres. The Dean of Peterborough preached on the Feast of Pentecost, per stringing those of Geneva for their irreverence of the Blessed Virgin. 4th June 1651, Trinity Sunday, I was absent from church in the afternoon on a charitable affair for the abbess of Bourchavon, who but for me had been abused by that chemist Dumini. 
Returning, I stepped into the Grand Jesuits, who had this high day exposed their sabarium, made all of solid gold and imagery, a piece of infinite cost. Dr. Croydon, coming out of Italy and from Padua, came to see me on his return to England. 5th June 1651 I accompanied my Lord Strafford and some other noble persons to hear Madame Laverin sing, which she did both in French and Italian excellently well, but her voice was not strong. 7th June 1651, Corpus Christi Day, there was a grand procession, all the streets tapestried, several altars erected there, full of images and other rich furniture, especially that before the court, of a rare design and architecture. There were abundance of excellent pictures and great vases of silver. 13th June 1651. I went to see the collection of one Monsieur Poignant, which variety of agates, crystals, onyxes, porcelain, medals, statues, relievos, paintings, taidus and antiquities might compare with the Italian virtuosos. 21st June 1651. I became acquainted with Sir William Cortis, a very learned and judicious person of the Palatinate. He had been a scholar to Alstidius, the encyclopedist, was well advanced in years, and now resident for His Majesty at Frankfurt. 2nd July 1651. Came to see me the Earl of Strafford, Lord Ossory and his brother, Sir John Southcott, Sir Edward Starwell, two of my Lord Spencer's sons, and Dr. Stuart, Dean of St. Paul's, a learned and pious man, where we entertained the time upon several subjects, especially the affairs of England and the lamentable condition of our church. The Lord Gerard also called to see my collection of sieges and battles, 21st July 1651, an extraordinary fast was celebrated in our chapel, Dr. Stuart, Dean of St. Paul's, preaching. 2nd of August 1651, I went with my wife to Conflans, where were abundance of ladies and others bathing in the river. The ladies had their tents spread on the water for privacy. 29th August 1651, was kept as a solemn fast for the calamities of our poor church, now trampled on by the rebels. Mr. Waller, being at Saint-Germain, desired me to send him a coach from Paris to bring my wife's goddaughter to Paris to be buried by the common prayer. 6 September 1651. I went with my wife to Saint-Germain to condole with Mr. Waller's loss. I carried with me and treated at dinner that excellent and pious person, the Dean of St. Paul's, Dr. Stuart, and Sir Louis Dives, half-brother to the Earl of Bristol, who entertained us with his wonderful escape out of prison in White Hall, the very evening before he was to have been put to death, leaping down out of a jakes two stories high into the Thames at high water, in the coldest of winter and at night. So as by swimming he got to a boat that attended for him, though he was guarded by six musketeers. After this he went about in woman's habit, and then in a small coal man's, travelling two hundred miles on foot, embarked for Scotland with some men he had raised, who coming on shore were all surprised and imprisoned on the Marquis of Montrose's score, he not knowing anything of their barbarous murder of that hero. This he told us was his fifth escape, and none less miraculous, with this note that the charging through one thousand men, armed or whatever danger could befall a man, he believed could not more confound and distract a man's thoughts than the execution of a premeditated escape, the passions of hope and fear being so strong. This knight was indeed a valiant gentleman, but not a little given to romance when he spoke of himself. I returned to Paris the same evening. End of section 25